be over here, uh, and Chris uh, attended here at the Rochester Church of Christ and are teaching a class, is that right, Jeff? Um, World Views or something? And, uh, right. Anyway, they told me about it because it's something I'm kind of interested in as well, and I was excited to hear that we could conduct this job, so I said, yeah, absolutely, bring it in. Uh, it's something I didn't have to organize, and Chris took the, the ball and ran with it, and even made the posters, and, and so. Thank you for that and, and bringing me here. Uh, Dr. Strauss, many of you probably know him better than I do, but uh, Professor Emeritus and a longtime professor of theology and Christian philosophy at Lincoln Christian Seminary. He began teaching in 1967. Mm, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Published a great number of books and articles. Uh, I uh, found a tribute to him um, online. Uh, in tribute to Dr. Strauss before the House of Representatives in 1998, William Redmond spoke these words. Dr. Strauss has committed his life to the training of Christian ministers who today circle the globe in their service to people of many ethnic and racial group uh, groups. Dr. Strauss is no ordinary professor. For 40 years, his sharp mind has ignited sleepy minds. His commitment has influenced great accomplishments in others. His servant's heart has moved others to service. His profound grasp of reality has inspired others in such a way that they understand their place in the universe. So I'm sure what he has to say will be of extreme value to us today. And it's my privilege to, to bring to the floor. Thank you very much. You you no. <laughs> Welcome. Now don't fall asleep while I'm talking, Chris. Okay. <laughs> Now, uh, we haven't even started, and I'm talking about a break. Are we going to have a break? Nine <laughs> 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 and ten o'clock or what? Yeah. Uh, Could I just go on? I, just, I think there's something in the bio about someone falling out of the window. Yeah. 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 I just go to midnight. Whoever falls out first, I quit. <laughs> I'm not done, I just quit. <laughs> What, 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 uh, we can go, I don't know who that. Well, yeah, we can do that in about an hour or so. Yeah, seven but if you now, about or an hour, take a, yeah, a break. <laughs> about 8 o'clock. Yeah, I'll give you a break in your TV or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very, very much and for going to all the trouble here. Uh, heck, what's his name here? <laughs> I want to make a brief journey with you on... We live in the largest world we've ever been. And if you know, I'm not telling you anything. It's not like a high school camp or a chapel. <clears throat> that you probably lose ground with those. But uh, we live in a world of um, over 5,000 ethnic groups and 7,200 languages and dialects. The world is large and quite complex. Now, I take uh, from the Bible, and commit to the scriptures, so I don't have to, you don't have to worry about what I'm going to uh, I believe the Lord's final commission, I don't talk about the Great Commission, all of His commissions are great. And the Lord's final commission sent us to a world that we live in in the 21st century. There isn't anybody here that doesn't believe that. Maybe the five or six year old uh, mental giant back here, she's chewing gum, <laughs> honey, frail back there, she doesn't know that. But we live in a very large world. And some of the things you may already know, so I've just come to reinforce you. And in a little while, I want to uh, look at the Bible. It's like uh, quite often preachers, uh, they have a little Bible and they depart there from and never return there to. <clears throat> and uh, uh, want to have a, at least a study in the 17th chapter of Acts. But in, in the content, tomorrow, if you don't already, because some of you are already studying worldview category, let me talk to you what that means. Now that... The Bible has always had a worldview, and I'll say this uh, for everyone here is concerned. There's an enormous uproar in the so-called, whatever that is, evangelical world about the loss of foundationalism and neo-evangelical and neo conservative you, These are jargon words, I'm sorry I mentioned them. They're not swear words. They're just, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of garbage talking. And what really happens with the loss of foundation, they totally misunderstand that foundationalism did not have its origin in Descartes, and foundationalism didn't have its origin in the Enlightenment. These are cliches they keep talking about. This, And tomorrow, if you can come back, 
if you can't come back, we'll do it tomorrow. Christian and I will just talk to ourselves. And uh, we have conversations before. You know, so I suppose we are. Right? And uh, we're going to talk about uh, the Enlightenment presuppositions and modernism as it develops, the scientific issues that developed in the 19th century, just overwhelmingly. And the 20, 21st century, uh, we talk about postmodernism. Now, the word postmodernism in English entered the lexicon in the 1980s. Not that it was new, but it's in the lexicon, it's on the street. And what does that mean? Well, if you don't know what modernism is, you know what post is. That's a prefix. You know, if you know what modernism, you don't know what anti is or post or any of those things. So we're not going to play games because we just have a few hours to talk about what it, it, we need a minimum of 30 graduate hours to discuss what I'm just going to mention to you. I don't mean 30 class hours, I mean 30 <coughs> academic hours. And uh, we're going to look at the worldview, understand that the Bible alone, in Genesis 1-1, that's the only place in all the world's literature that affirms the absolute creation of the universe. There's no such affirmation in any of the so-called Babylonian creation myths. It's a myth that those are Babylonian myths. The Greeks, were, the matter was eternal, so they had no creation concept. Only in the Judeo, I speak of Judeo-Christian because the Torah Bible, the Judeo-Christian tradition, what? And because most of you didn't have flaws to pull over Hebrew, uh, we had some dudes here that quote uh, the Hebrew of Genesis 1 1, but it's the only place in the world's literature that makes a claim of the absolute origin of the time space finite world. The only place. Now, that's the biblical foundation to me, not Descartes nor, <laughs> nor the Enlightenment. That the foundation is the foundation. Now, that's what gives astrophysics and people fits about. Uh, about the very structure of reality. We need the periodic chart and the DNA particle. All of those things are part and parcel of a Christian viewpoint. Now, Christian viewpoint, the Lord said, go into all the ethics. The, there are 7,200 ethnic groups. He sent us to all of them with 5,000 plus languages. So we can't just pick out our comfort zone and then talk with Marty Frickett because she doesn't know any of these things. One doesn't go to, to Mayo's. We have dudes right here just close to Mayo. You don't go to Mayo's uh, to tell the doctor what to do about brain surgery. Probably not. Well, why does the church then take, take a poll? When you take polls when you don't know what you're doing. And you color code it. See? The yellows are here, and the blues are over here, and the orchids are here, and the undecided are back here in the poll. You don't decide what truth is by taking polls. Those of you, because some of you are mathematicians here, the calculus of probability can never tell you what the truth is. It can only tell you what certain groups and statistics of the group, what they believe. That is not the same thing as what either one of them may be wrong. We have to examine that, and that's part of the Christian concern of a worldview. The Lord created the world. He sent us to every inch of the world. I don't need him to say that, but Cardinal Newman said, God created the world and he wants every inch of it back. And I believe that is the Christian enterprise. He wants every inch of the universe back. It's his. And we've deformed it. So I want you to look just quickly at that before we study in Acts 17, which I take to be a biblical model, and unless you're Southern Baptist. Paul doesn't go to Corinth and, and give up thinking, and he went to Emodi in, in Corinth. You get the standard nonsense, uh, still widespread in our heritage. Uh, the only thing wrong with that is it's wrong. <laughs> it's the most serious flaw that it had. But I want you to keep in mind, tomorrow we're going to take the examination of the absolute creation of the universe. Now that issue, and I am not, you know that. I am not an astrophysicist. Oh, you thought maybe it was. <laughs> if I were one, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> so you got that. But astrophysics alone can deal with the nature of matter. Well, what does that have to do with Christianity and salvation in Christ and the cross? Everything in the world. 
because the God that created him, and I believe Polkinghorne, Greek mathematical physicist from Cambridge and Oxford, said that the incarnation alone can enable Christians to escape idolatry. If he is not God incarnate, then we don't even have a helpful buddy. So there's an enormous discussion, you know that, nothing that you need to hear again, about Jesus Christ. If he is not God incarnate, we have no solution and no message and no purpose for existence. And no reason to have Christian schools and no reason to have churches and uh, Sunday school, whatever you have, uh, parent church or anything else. Now in the universe, now 